Hello everyone to episode 22 of Behind Our Science. Today we're wrapping up Capitol Hill Day. We have an interesting interview with Kelsey the Lady, as well as have a segment on the intersection of poetry and science guided by Daisy Shu. Hope you enjoyed the episode. So how Capitol Hill works is we will have a schedule in which we're meeting with different representatives throughout the day. What we are basically doing is we have meetings in which we try to foster for or advocate for more funding and keeping funding alive for NIH, NSF and other agencies through meeting with representatives and explaining the importance and the relevance of keeping research active. And so what happens is um, we'll have structured meetings in which we are split up by the state of which we're representing. For me, it'll be New Mexico. There's other people going for Ohio, New York, different states in the US. And so what will happen is each of us will meet we have different groups, different researchers, and we're pair up. What we'll do is we'll have a structure of a meeting in which we'll explain the needs for each of the agencies we're representing. And then we try to talk about our research, how it impacts our community, the amount of funding that we're requesting, and then hopefully hearing back from the representatives, the senators, what the constituents want, what people are looking for, and how it impacts our daily lives. And so throughout these meetings, we're able to be in Capitol Hill with the representatives in their actual offices. And through those meetings, we build a relationship that allows scientific communication. And so that's what we're striving for today. So let me, let me tell you, so for me, the, the in-person Capitol Hill was, was very excited. Um, mm -hmm. I, was, I was deeply excited because I thought um, I mean, the opportunity to actually be there um, was, at least to me, it, it, it was it was great. I don't know how, how you felt, because I mean, it's also your first time. Yeah. No, I mean, I think, you know, I'd heard other people share their experiences about Hill Day or, you know, just being on Capitol Hill and advocating for biomedical research, whether it be a FACIB Hill Day or through another society. Um, and I think it's one thing to hear other people describe it, but it's certainly a different thing to experience it for yourself in person for the first time. So I went in with like, not a lot of expectations. I just kind of went in and just was excited to be a part of the day and kind of, um, have the experience. And, um, even without having a lot of expectations going into it, I feel like it far exceeded kind of what I was expecting to get out of it. It's very rewarding to sit down. Um, with your state and local representatives and talk to them about biomedical research and why it's so important, um, you know, for human health, for your community and things like that. And so it was really fun to get to talk to them and kind of emphasize the importance of the work that we're doing um, and to reiterate why funding, federal funding for biomedical research is such an important thing. Yeah, I think it was like, Mind blowing, at least the the ambience around like that whole area, um, because I saw kids going around. Um, I, I was guessing there were field trips, um, people um going around like doing stuff. It seems like it's very different than just doing like virtual or maybe doing it in like your own state. It seems like this thing is like it's 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 a yeah. thing. So the feeling was like, yeah, you, you can embrace it. You feel like politics flowing around. And so, yeah, there's something there's something really exciting about being on Capitol Hill and like seeing all the hustle and bustle. And you're right, like half the time I was, you know, like, is that a staffer or is that somebody who is here doing the same thing we're doing today? They're here yes. to advocate for, um, you know, a topic that's important to them. And so it's just really interesting to think like, you know, we were there that day representing biomedical research, but it definitely um creates an environment where there's a lot of excitement around like feeling like you're a part of something that you're playing a role in helping to inform or influence policy that ultimately has a direct impact on us as biomedical researchers on our states and our institutions 
um, and on our colleagues, right, who are also doing the same thing we're doing, trying to get federal funding to help support their science. And so, uh, yeah, it was really interesting. And you mentioned having seen kids on on Capitol Hill, right? They're they're touring the Capitol building. They're learning more about how the government works. And I think it was one of the things that I realized while I was there, and I was doing some of the educational training that FASIB offers, and just being there and experiencing it for myself. Like there's so much that I still don't really understand about how our government works. Yeah. <laughs> it's certainly outside of my area of expertise. So it was really, um, I think, um, enlightening to like, just kind of, you're almost like seeing, like feeling like you're getting a glimpse behind the curtain a little bit about how things work. Right. And so I thought that was really kind of an exciting and fulfilling um, experience. Yeah. And I have to say there was something that I found at least, I mean, we were there for the full day. And I mean, we were there for like a short amount of time. You get up, I mean, for me, it was like the two hour change. Probably you're in the East Coast, so it's not that different. But it, it may, either way, you're up early. You just um, took a trip. And a full day just means like you're all day, like doing all um, like meetings after meetings after meetings. And then what's next, right? I almost felt like a little overwhelmed of what, what they have to go through. Because a lot of the representatives, what I saw is, they were like back to back meetings and then you have to switch your your brain to like, oh, this person wants something about health and then this person wants something about something else or like that. So I guess it's also important that people understand like these are not people just sitting around. I thought they were like just sitting around and just like, I don't know, just doing, I don't know, just, I don't know, writing email. I don't know. Admin work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, no, the staffers are busy, right? Like, yeah, it just felt like we were being shuffled in as another group often was being shuffled out yeah. and they had just, you know, had their 15 to 30 minutes of FaceTime with um, one of the, you know, representative staffers or maybe someone who specializes in that particular area of content. Um, but yeah, like I agree. I, I didn't really realize just how busy those offices are and how many um, people come in and out of those offices every day, um, you know, bringing issues or requesting support, you know, at various levels throughout the federal government um, to really make their voices be heard. So I thought that was also kind of inspiring, but I totally agree. I sympathize with the staffers. They all seemed exhausted to me. <laughs> I yeah. felt tired. And then I'm thinking, wow, they're just as tired as we are because, you know, for every meeting that we've had, they've probably had twice as many. They just stay in one place and we just had to take time to move from room to room, um, from office to office. So it definitely mm -hmm. seems like, a. uh, very uh, busy, but maybe sometimes exciting uh, role to be in when you work in a representative's office as as a staffer. Yeah, and I think it's it's good to say that they're, they it seems like they're busy, but also, I mean, you can genuinely see when someone's paying attention to what you're doing, and a lot of them are coming from your own state, so a lot of them are either related and uh, to the to the place that they're representing, and so what they do, the staffers are sort of like. They understand a little bit of what they they they're talking about, maybe not not fully, but they understand part of it. One of the things that I've heard mostly from people nowadays is like, "Well, you won there, like, so what? What now? Like, do you think anything's gonna happen? So, what do you think?" I mean, I think it's like maybe my thought is, is if you don't ask you may never get it, right? So we went in and we were asking for $51.3 billion for the NIH, right? I think $16.7 billion for the NSF and then you learned, additional you're, funding. You learned your stats. Yeah, you, yeah you I still remember stats. my stats, yeah. right? I memorized those before Hill Day. Um, and, you know, thinking about President Biden's budget and the fact that it fell a little bit short of where we would have liked it to be. But I think it's one of those things, like if you're not there and you're not advocating for it and you're not asking for it and you're not providing the justification about why that level of funding is important and really needed to support biomedical research, you may never actually get it. So I think the most important thing that comes out of that day is I really felt like we had good representation from FASIB and all of its member societies and good representation across, you know, the various states, right? We had a lot of folks, I think it ended up being like representatives from 26 states, I think. I, I forget. I think that was the number. Um, but like, I think we were definitely there making our voices heard. And I no, my one of my homework assignments still is to send some follow up communications to the staffers that we met with to kind of really reiterate 
um, what we're asking for and why we're asking for it, why it's important. And then, um, as you know, as part of the Research and Science Policy Committee for the ASIP, we're also requesting that our members really help with this advocacy and amplify our voices by contacting their, their own representatives, their state representatives, their local representatives, and really unifying our voices in this ask. And I think sometimes the more it's being asked for and the more you know, the frequency and the consistency at which that messaging is being conveyed to the people in the position to really be advocating for the funding levels that we want, the higher the likelihood that our voices will be heard. So, um, you know, I think for me, when I think about what are next steps personally, you know, I need to send those follow-up emails. I haven't done my homework yet. Um, <clears throat> but also too, like I said, just ex sharing our experience with other people who maybe don't realize the importance of making their voices be heard, whether that be, you know, an email communication or con calling or inviting their local representative to come to their institution, to their laboratory to visit, to really help them understand what funding for biomedical research does um, for, for, for our institutions, for our community, um, and really making sure that the importance of the work that we're doing is being heard and is being recognized. And then that when we need additional funding or increases in funding to keep up with innovation and technology and to really continue the work that we're doing, um, that that messaging is being communicated in a concise and consistent manner. Yeah, I agree. And I think one of the things that I've learned through this process, because again, you sort of like start guessing or second guessing, is this going to even make a difference, right? In one person, one meeting with thousands of other requests are come in, but I've heard from other people as well that um, contacting representatives and advocating, not just for this, let's say it's anything else, um, asking is just a mere process in between. So if you ask and then you don't get a reply or get a no or a possibly or whatever, it's getting your foot through the door. And I know that representatives for each state not only have like their job is not just only doing that. They advocate for other things. For example, when I was doing my my green card process, I remember someone told me that they actually reached out to the representative and they can inquire with USCIS about their case, as in like one of my um, constituents has, has a case and it's pending. And I've heard that they get some feedback or direct feedback from USCIS. So I'm guessing there's other processes in which they get involved. And so yeah. the reality is that we might not be asking the right question, meaning maybe not asking even directly what you really need. In, in this instance, I think communicating through this process, which is through an actual society or a big conglomerate of societies, which is passive, mm -hmm. um, it allows them to, that the voice is not just um, like just in the wind, it goes away with the wind. It goes into like the the this this whole section about advocating for research. So yeah. I mean, for me, that's what it is. Um, but I, and I feel like it's important. And I'm also doing something that I that I believe it's it's right, and I want to do it. Same as like people that um, believe that in like voting or like doing anything for the community, right? So I, I think that's that's a good thing for yeah. you, um, Kelsey. What do you think is something? Because I mean, you are deeply involved in research, science, and policy. But yeah. Um, one of the things that we're trying to advocate here is why would people care? So why would yeah. you tell them? Um, I mean, I think, you know, speaking to our biomedical community, right? Investigators like ourselves or, you know, the um, trainees who who work in our laboratories or our students at our at our universities and our academic medical centers, you know, like really federal funding underpins the majority of the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. It allows us to educate the future of medicine and science, and it allows us to make biomedical breakthroughs that improve human health. And so it, I can understand feeling like your voice, you know, maybe doesn't, um, necessarily carry the weight that you would like it to like what's the point of reaching out to my representative right they they don't I'm just I'm just so and so and they don't really care about what my opinion or what my needs are and I think that's actually the biggest takeaway that I took from Hill Day is that they do actually care and they do want to know and um your your request or your opinions or your thoughts aren't necessarily falling on deaf ears now just because you've made the ask doesn't necessarily mean 
that what you're asking for is going to be possible. And I think that was the other thing that I had to learn is that, you know, we can make these requests of our representatives and they can petition for support for what we're asking for. But at the end of the day, they also don't necessarily have all of the control that's needed to really push something into fruition. So, um, but again, I think, you know, if we're not talking about these things, then, then nothing will ever, you know, we'll never get more funding. We'll never, things will never improve. And so I think that that was my biggest takeaway is that my individual voice does carry power, that my representatives do want to hear about the things that are impacting me directly as one of their constituents. And that by not communicating with them, I'm not changing anything, right? I might not make changes every time I reach out, but if I do nothing, I'm certainly making no improvements and no changes. So um, I think that was my biggest takeaway is that my voice matters. And then the other thing is too, is they do want to hear from you. And if you communicate with them on a regular enough basis about the topics that are important to you, 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 you create a camaraderie, you create a relationship with your representative or with their staffers who are experts on the type of policies that are important to you. Um, and that opens up more of a dialogue, right? And it essentially makes your voice maybe more powerful because you've established those type of relationships with your state and local representatives and their staffers. Um, so I would say that's the other takeaway is that it, it doesn't have to be a one-time communication. I think there's benefit to creating those types of relationships and having an ongoing dialogue um, with your representatives who have the ability to influence policy changes. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I agree 100%. And I think, I mean, um, as a, like a, I guess, a message for people that are wanting to do something, but maybe not, Capitol Hill is not the right place. Maybe they don't want to actually travel there there's like small things that you can do for example you will yours is not small but you do um you're you're, you're um, head of the research science and policy committee but yeah. also there's minimal other things if you don't want to reach out to your representatives there's like ways to promote uh people to actually do so like i said through societies they are always looking for early career mid-career and um uh, yeah. more like senior people to become not representatives but maybe join a committee that actually works on it because as you learn from policy, you learn that it's more important to actually advocate. Things do not happen just because. And so I think um, learning about the process might not be the, the sexiest process that we want to get involved in, but it's it's what it is. It's it's something that needs to be done. But also, mm -hmm. I mean, I look forward for next year because I, I did have a good time and I think yeah. it makes a whole lot of difference when you're there and you feel the the actual presence there. But I yeah. think it was a great experience. So for me, it was, it was great. Yeah. I think sometimes it's, it's not always easy to see the way that, you know, federal policies, funding decisions, like have a direct impact on you as an individual, or if you're a trainee or, you know, maybe, uh, your, your, you know, research assistant in a lab, it's not always necessarily apparent to you as an individual about how those decisions directly impact you. But, um, I think that was one of my other takeaways is it in, and as I become more in tune with and a following science policy and understanding more about how those decisions have a direct impact on us as constituents, um, you know, I think that, uh, it just emphasizes the importance of this type of advocacy, right? Because it really does impact us directly. It might not impact your day to day to day, or it might not necessarily be something that you realize is impacting your day to day, but it certainly has a direct impact on you as an individual working in biomedical research or working at an academic medical center or a university that is, you know, doing federally funded research. And so, um, I think that was one of my other kind of big takeaways from that. But I think anyone who has any interest in learning more about science policy, um, I agree. I think one of the best ways to learn more, to become more involved at kind of a, a group level is to reach out to your societies that you're a member of and ask them if they have a science policy committee. And if they do, are they interested in in having more members join their committee? I can almost guarantee no, you that no, the answer, the answer to that is, is yes. yes. We are always looking for more individuals who have an interest in learning more about research and science policy and who want to become involved in the work that we're doing um, on behalf of our societies. And so I would definitely encourage anyone who is listening and has an interest in this to pursue those opportunities 
without reservation because I think it's a great way to learn more. It's a great way to make connections. Um, and in the best case scenario, you might end up being that person who is asked to represent your society at a Hill Day in Washington, D.C. and get to have the same experiences that you and I just had that, you know, in talking with you, clearly we both found a lot of um, fulfillment and being a part of. Yeah, I think it's it's a great opportunity. So thank you very much, Kelsey, for taking the yeah. time. I and mean, we look forward to having you more as we may, might do more of these um, research science like spotlights because we yeah. I think it advocates for people learning about it in a mm -hmm. digestive and easy way. Um, but yeah. thank you very much. Hopefully you get to go next year. So <laughs> I know I look forward to seeing you there. It was yes. a pleasure touring Capitol Hill with you that day. And uh, it's always nice to see a familiar face when you're when you're in a new place. So um, thanks for the opportunity to let you know about my experience on Capitol Hill Day. I really hope that this inspires others to take action and um, to make their voices be heard. And um, I would definitely recommend people who don't know where to start to check out the FASIB um, website for advocacy, because that's a great way to kind of learn who your representatives are and identify their contact information. So that way, if you really want to get started in your own advocacy adventure, um, I think that's a great place to start. Yeah, we'll leave the details for the, in the, for the description. Of the Hello, and welcome back to Behind Our Science. This April, we're diving into the beautiful confluence of poetry and science, celebrating National Poetry Month. I'm Daisy, and I'll be your host today for our Behind Our Science episode, uh, interviewing the wonderful and amazing Mayank Chu, uh, who is a good friend of mine. Um, he's a remarkable individual uh, who lives at the intersection of science and poetry, so he was the most apt um, interviewee for our episode. Uh, Mayank is a cell and developmental biologist and a diversity at activist at Harvard Medical School. He's also a poet and an artist. Mayank, welcome to our show. Yay, thank you. Thank you for thinking of me and thank you for having me here. I'm looking forward to amazing conversation. <laughs> Yay. Uh, I'm so happy that you're here because um, we're actually great friends that uh, we connected through the Harvard Medical Postdoc Association. Uh, this was um, back in the day, just before the pandemic. I think that's when we first met and then it, the pandemic unfolded and all that. Um, but uh, you were the chair of the association and I was um, on the um, communications committee, which was really fun. Um, so tell us a little bit about your work. You're deeply involved in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and belonging initiatives. Um, and tell, tell us a little bit about the DEIB working group. Of course. I think, you know, I think you probably, you know, you said that we have, you know, worked together and we met. And I think this is amazing to have this conversation now across literally on the other sides of the earth, right? And Having lived through pandemic together, in the being in the same community and work through the same community, I think it might actually bring some nostalgic uh, feelings for you as well. So yeah, I mean, you know, I think the time at the HMPA chair, uh, which HMPA for others, I'm just I should probably elaborate. HMPA stands for Harvard Medical Postdoc Association, and uh, yeah, I was a chair for lot like, two years from 2021 to 23. And during the same time, I was also the chair of the Departmental Diversity, Equity, Inclusion and Belonging uh, subgroup on fair recruitment. And these leadership positions, you know, have been personally so rewarding and transformative for me. And these positions have also um, allowed me to pivot towards what I I figure my calling is that is tackling, you know, questions of social justice in STEM higher education based on and my education and my technical skills and expertise, my uh, comprehensive knowledge of the STEM landscape, and of course, lived experiences. And I think with that, I think, let me take you into the sort of work I have been doing over the past few years that you are familiar with, Daisy. Uh, so I have, you know, as a chair and, and in both these different um, 
groups uh, at the same institution have held um, and led, well, multiple roles and led multiple teams, um, multiple community engagement initiatives and research investigations, which all are directed at the postdoctoral population and also in a group which is led by postdocs. So I think this is amazing grassroots level research and community engagement and outreach. So I think that has been my forte. And I think in terms of research, which has basically pulled me into my calling is primarily um, the postdoctoral sort of sociology research as such, I say it. So I've been excited, for example, about how social dimensions of inequity of race, gender, citizenship, and socioeconomic status impact of uh, STEM higher education workforce, where I emphasize particularly on early career researchers slash postdocs and innovation. So, you know, thinking about the socioeconomic status, um, you know, we at the HMPA led this postdoc compensation case study uh, where we collected uh, data uh, about postdoctoral compensation, including salaries, you know, and other expenses such as childcare um, among HMS and HMS affiliated institutions. And we analyzed uh, Boston cost of living analysis and, you know, compared how these cost of living analysis in the Boston area actually compared to postdoc salaries and the expenses they end up paying. And of course, you know, with the data, we had assumed that we, like the postdocs are really living subpar for the amount of skills, education they have, and what they get in return in terms of monetary payment, right? And the benefits, let's put that, or the compensation is probably the word that we should go with that sort of encapsulates everything. So um, our research, for instance, you know, argued with this data that we had collected that postdoc salaries if they are unadjusted for geographical cost of living, that can create selection pressure for scholars who are coming from marginalized background to retain and flourish in academia. And let me be very, very specific. This particular study, of course, um, is in the U.S. context. And it, of course, could be true in other you know, countries as well. But particularly in the U.S., uh, how postdocs uh, compensation really works is that <clears throat> the National in Institutes of Health um, offer a stipend scale for a fellowship and that universities adopt to follow the postdoc compensation, sort of de facto creating salaries similar to that NIH proposed scales. However, that salary does not take into account uh, a huge um, sort of discrepancy in the cost of living in the United States. For instance, the salary of 50K might be okay for, you know, for a single person living in <clears throat> Idaho or Iowa City. However, it is not okay or that salary basically falls really, really short if we compare to the East Coast and the West Coast cities, for instance, New York, Boston, or on the other side, San Francisco, LA. In fact, today I ended up figuring out that there is a new analysis by Smart Asset, and then they estimate that you require at least about 125K for as as a single person, if you would want to live comfortably in Boston. And we, as postdocs, even with the hype that we have managed in the last, you know, years, which was a huge bump of 20%, but be beyond, like, <clears throat> besides that bump we have had, we are still less than 50% of what this study now estimated to be living comfortably in Boston area. So obviously, if you are coming from, like, sort of, poor or socioeconomic uh, background that pose a barrier to your success and for to you to actually pursue your own academic dreams, you really can't juggle both things, right? And especially if you have to take care of children and you have dependents at home, you just can't. So if you think about 
you know, institutions and organizations. And as a scientific community, we talk about spaces, making spaces more inclusive and diverse. And, and we use terms like inclusive excellence or broadening participation. But if you now take into consideration that people, if they are struggling to basically live in a city, let alone pay for their children or their dependents, of course, how they're going to retain in the academy, right? I mean, it creates a selection pressure. And I think that is just so counterproductive to our aims and the goals of institutions. And so we need to act. I think we, I want to, you know, approach these <clears throat> fundamental problems of real society and real academia from an empirical point of view. And I think with that study, we were able to sort of... Um, <clears throat> Trigger such conversations, and I think this was important. And I think, yeah, I think it's much needed, and it is really, really important. I, of course, I'm biased because I'm excited about that research. So Daisy, you can chime in and say, no, it's not. So give me other point of views, and that works too. I agree, hundred percent, with you um, on the importance of this topic. Um, it is something that I think we need to talk about more, especially when it comes to money. It's something that we don't like to talk about. It's one of those taboo conversations, if anything. Um, and I like that you um, you took that initiative um, as part of the HMPA uh, and, you know, assess the, the, um, the living expenses of all the, the postdocs in the Boston area. And, and honestly, it was, uh, it's crazy, as you said, like, you know, the cost of living is, is very high in Boston. Um, and you're lucky to even get a decent share house situation. Um, and that's pretty much the life of most of the postdocs, at least for me, I had uh, two roommates when I first moved into Boston. Um, and I think that that's like the most feasible situation to be able to have enough to buy groceries. And that's just to get by um, on the bare minimum, I would say. Uh, whereas, yeah, like you were saying, in, in, in other states, uh, you could be living uh, in luxury almost, like not, you know, in comparative to, to someone in Boston, you would have your own one bedroom to yourself um in mm -hmm. like a close city center location um right. so yeah it's hard to kind of create that scale um but it needs to be considered and uh that needs to be talked about a bit more so that we can make moves to allow that equity um with different living circumstances absolutely absolutely <laughs> I think this just came from, you know, your experiences of living here in Boston here as well. And, you yeah. know, I have heard that, you know, the situation is a bit similar in Australia as well, but I don't know not to what extent because I've not really lived there. So, <laughs> so I'm yeah. also curious how, in Australia, how similar or dissimilar the situation in Australia or Sydney or, you know, in big cities are. Yeah, the interesting thing about Australia is the postdoc is regarded as a um as a pretty much a profession of like you're you're not a trainee anymore. You're actually a, a fully fledged academic. Um I'm not sure if you're part of considered part of faculty as yet. I think um there is I think it you do have to go up another stage um to be able to independently apply for grants. Um, but as because of that, you know, um, because of you're not considered a trainee anymore, you actually get a starting salary of around about, I think it's about like 80K at least, which is almost double of what the stipend was, uh, NH stipend was like when we started, essentially, um, which is crazy to think that because, um, yeah, yeah, we're not considered like in Australia, postdocs aren't considered trainees. Um, and I think this has to be some like language around um, what a postdoc is uh, because mm -hmm. you've completed your training in your PhD. Um, mm -hmm. is, is a postdoc then a, an employed situation where, you know, you are actually a fully fledged, you know, individual who's a researcher. Um, you do have a mentor, but you're not a trainee per se. Um, so yeah, it's interesting, like kind of language around that. Um, 
because they are pretty like I would say that because of a PhD process is quite lengthy uh, at least in the US um they end up being like close to you know 30s or so and still regarded as a trainee so it's like I think there has to be some sort of um recognition that it is different um because sometimes it's just lumped as trainee um Mm -hmm. so yeah it's an interesting discussion yeah (laughs) yeah so uh, that was uh yeah really interesting to talk about because I think you've done a lot of great work here now we'll switch gears a little bit and move into a bit of the science and the poetry um I um When I first heard that you were a poet, I was amazed and I was like, wow, you are the first scientist poet that I've ever met in my life. Um, (laughs) So maybe other people just don't reveal their identities as such. (laughs) Maybe, maybe they're just closet poets. Um, yeah, Yeah, there are probably many out there. And to our listeners, if you are a closet poet, please let us know. Uh, because we're very fascinated uh, and would like to hear your poetry. Um, So tell us a little bit about how you got into poetry and whether or not it intersects with some of the science or influences the scientific work you do. Hmm. Um, I think I have always loved reading and writing. Um, and I think I started out from <clears throat> writing fiction and I think then moved into poetry, realizing that was I had this, you know, penchant for words and the power of words and what they can actually mean and what they can deliver. Um, and I think that sort of and also the sense of an open endedness where you you write something with so much precision, but at the same time, you leave up, you leave literally your manuscript, in this case, like poem, poem text, to the readers where they can draw the conclusions that they would want based on their own experiences. So it gives power to people, yet it gives me power as a writer, as a poet to write things in my own from my own world and in my own language but yeah to sort of so I I I find it very very intriguing and I think uh, maybe it's part of me you know having that rational approach to life maybe you know I am a scientist and I approach things in a different way so maybe I see that intrinsically in my head how poetry and um research or scientific research might be linked i see a lot of similarities between poetry and science for instance you know just to even broadly speaking science you know in our labs we are basically revealing secrets of the nature or from the nature we are discovering things we are discovering cellular pathways we are discovering you know how tissues work we're discovering you know how molecules work and how they actually end up impacting some pathology so we can cure them but in the end of the day the bottom line is they are revealing secrets and poetry is not different of course because poetry is using that language uh, ambiguity in the language with such precise fashion and then you know but at the same time it is you end up revealing secrets the outer like the person who's reading it they you know they end up like revealing their own secrets and I think one thing beyond, of course, you know, needless to mention here that creativity and imagination are both, you know, involved in both. And they both basically reinforce both of these avenues of, you know, poetry and scientific pieces as such. <clears throat> and I think one thing that I personally feel a lot, and I think, um, and I am really, really vocal about is as well, is that you know, I think there's a narrative and or there's an image that we have for scientists, of course. And I think I'm trying to basically undo that image. For instance, you know, when you ask a kid about how what a scientist really looks like, we basically end up portraying scientists as in these lab coats and tend to be white male guy, right? White man in the lab with like some beakers and stuff. So that's scientists. But like, there's a But that does not, you know, there are bigger problems to why the image is that way. But what I'm trying to get at is 
we also see scientists more as robots doing things in a robotic manner and approaching things with rationale but not with emotions while poetry would be based on emotional uh emotional understanding emotional processing healing you know and you know all those emotions essentially so i am advocating for scientists as humans so with their emotions but at the same time they can be rational and i think that is re- where the synergy for me comes in and i think i love that very very much yeah i i love the idea of revealing secrets um in science uh through through tapping into the molecular pathways and that um that's a really beautiful way of putting uh, our work of discovery research um and yeah i like how that plays into the whole poetry as using a language to um in in that precise way but also in that way that you know leaves the reader um you know you know with open ended questions or kind of insights into their own um psyche per se <laughs> um exactly. but yeah yeah it's so fascinating um so when uh, like I'm just curious from the perspective of like getting into poetry uh is this something you started when you were really young and and you pretty much just um and then you started science or was it the other way around like what was the kind of <laughs> situation there <laughs> uh I think I've always been such a creative person so I used to paint and write as a as a child as a kid whatever you know um and I was always told that that's an extracurricular like you can't have a career because it doesn't pay arts never pay so you must build a career that is more um more sustainable you know and of course if, especially if you're like first generation family then you know other things sort of comes along and you start want to do better to come out of you know like weird past and etc etc um however yeah so i've always been excited um as i said before i think at about 17 i was more serious around writing so i got into fiction first because i loved writing and then i discovered that i think poetry is more my jam of course i'm not opposed to writing fiction i love writing generally but i think poetry is a way for me personally to process how i feel to communicate how i feel to advocate for things to fight for things and it just as you know it reveals secrets for me by me you know so it's amazing and it also is interactive with other people as in like how they would want to connect with those experiences yeah it's fascinating and it's something that i for me poetry was something i struggled with in like as an assignment in class like i never really actively oh, sought out to write my own poetry um so <laughs> yeah it's like really fascinating i loved it <laughs> I loved it. So, you know, like, you know, in English lit classes, I think poetry used to be like, I can still recite a few lines from my 11th grade school books. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah, I mean, I would just so, it, like, <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, this is so good because it's just a word. How, imagine, like, the fact that you can put four words in a sentence and they have the power to transform your thinking or transform you in a specific way and i think that is magnificent for instance you know i'm not i'm not going to recite some poetry from other people for example recently i heard this phrase from buddha and it was written in one of these you know books so sort of cheesy and stuff but the saying goes as follows don't calm the storm calm yourself the storm would pass few words just few words but it still blows my mind how the impact this phrase had on me because it's so amazing that you know people are going through something or the other all the time and you know based on our traumas or our childhood or you know bunch of bigger societal 
perspectives or the sort of the societal box that we live in. We are constantly impacted by things happening around us. And of course, there's a storm all the time that can trigger storms within us. But like this phrase, just enlighten me. And of course, it's coming from Buddha. So I, again, you know, time and again, do feel enlightened by it. So yeah, where I was going with that is that there's so much power in words. And of course, I feel amazed by that. And I think that is what exactly draws me to poetry. Yeah, that's very well said. And that's a beautiful um, yeah, quote there. And we'll definitely kind of pull that out because I think that that is a really, really nice way of putting it, um, uh, calming um, yourself. Uh, it's it's something like, yeah, we've been talking about a bit on the podcast, like um, uh, self-care practices, wellness practices, and acknowledging that the storm will pass. I really like that because it is like a momentary thing, uh, which you mm-hmm. can believe in that moment, of course, because mm-hmm. it's so uh, just ravaging, I guess. But um, it's so it's nice to, yeah, as you said, with the language, like that kind of kind of just shifts your mindset all of a sudden. Um, and, and uh, yeah, it's really powerful. Um, and on the note of sharing poetry, um, would you uh, be so kind as to share some of your poetry to our listeners? Of course. Uh, so do we want a short poem or not so short poem? Um, can we have the, uh, can we have both? <laughs> of course. Oh, oh, I don't know. Um, so, do we just go with the... How how what's the time time difference there <laughs> between the two? Oh, it's not like it's literally one is probably less than one minute. Another one is probably between one and two minutes. Um, let's do the maybe the one minute. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, actually, I don't know. What do you think? We can cut this. Um, <laughs> yes, I mean they're they're like there too. I'll read out to in like in, in just this time, so you can pick on whatever you want then. Okay, we'll, we'll do both. <laughs> Yay! Thank you. <laughs> of course. Okay. Yay! Take it away. Yay! <laughs> so this poem is a very short poem. It's called "When We Were Young." I'm gonna read that out now. When we were young. A white swan fluttered its wings under the water. It all began. You and I in the blue, a bisque of time wrapped in yellow kelp sweet. Kissing the rippling life inside and outside. Dancing with every ray of sunshine coursing through our hearts. Float, we float, we float, endless. Bravo. So that was all. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, so this poem is very small and you can, of course, figure out the context is rather more towards romantic, you know, or more relationship oriented. Um, the other po- poem um, is more intense with the meanings <clears throat> it carries. But yeah, so I think you have another flavor of it. So I'm going to read out one now. This one is called Cat in the Church. <clears throat> Cat in the Church. Emerald are eyes of gold. Pray. Man dressed up in iron and stone to bless you. Pray. With the sun of beige skin and sapphire eyes. Pray. Because daughter would be a woman. Pray like ugly cats, no matter brown or black. Pray are homeless or wander in houses. 
pray for love that does not exist. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Thank that you. Was incredible. Um, and yeah, it for me, I mean, you know how they talk like with the scientists, um, it they always say, you know, left brain, right brain. Um my very left brain. <laughs> um it, for me, like I go to an art gallery and I'm always like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I I try to like appreciate it obviously but uh, for me I feel like I'm mm-hmm. it, it is something that it, it is something that I think I have to learn to how to appreciate at least uh, at least the more I go to and and expose myself to various uh, forms of art the more I I guess I am learning that muscle of appreciation of poetry uh, I, I feel like it just comes naturally to you, but to someone who is more of the left analytical brain, um, uh, how, what tips do you have like in terms of appreciating poetry and art in general? Ooh, uh, <laughs> I think that's a good question, but how I approach this is uh, from a very, very uh, naive uh, perspective, and that is, I got with a bit of confidence and understanding um, what I know and what my um, what my inclinations are, because art is so subjective. And I think we are living in an age where we don't have to necessarily live in a more structured world. You can go down an academic route, for instance, you know, learning all about poetry when did it start you know like talking about like modernism you know <clears throat> more period sort of poetry and more classical you know writers and then how the phrasing of the languages where the breaks and stuff like that but I think the state of poetry right now and what excites me more about poetry and <clears throat> generally art in that space is the contemporary nature of it, that you don't really have to be a poet and artist going through the school. You can actually use your creativity and express yourself in a way that becomes a medium for you and for others to hold on. So if you go to an art gallery or if you have a canvas with colors that you throw on and you think, this is amazing, I found a way to work around, or I found, oh, for instance, assume that you drew a flower with your fingertips, right? With a color on a canvas. And you found, you gave time impressions. So that's like essentially creating a technique, right? And if you like that, that's more important. And that's what it is important because art is primarily for you. That's how my belief is. It is for me. And it's a channel for me to express myself. But if people end up appreciating that and relating to it, finding that amazing, that's on them. So I, you know, art for me is more personal and it's more driven for me. So I, my only suggestion would be do things what you love and where you find most of yourself at home. For instance, if you like writing or reading, it doesn't matter, you know, if people shame you into reading some smutty novel, right? I mean, if that's your jam, that's your jam, (laughs) you know? So that's how I approach it. Like, that's for you. That's how you essentially express and it's just a medium of expression and you know you can think about you know sort of continuously working on it and knowing more about that entire space that's up to you if you would have the bandwidth but I would say just roll with it I can obviously suggest or share a few of my um favorite poets but you know it doesn't have to be your jam your jam could be entirely different so I'll say be yourself and find something where you feel most at home. That's or great. Find something new that doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Getting in touch with my inner self. Um, yeah. No, that's really great advice. Um, and on the note of sharing uh, about your favorite poet, uh, I'm wondering who is your favorite poet and why? And why does that hold a special, is there a poem that holds a special place in your heart? Hmm. 
Okay, of course, this is a very difficult question, right? <laughs> Picking up favorites.、Mm-hmm. Um, I think my favorite poet is Ocean Vuong, who is a contemporary Vietnamese American poet. And why Ocean, among others, I'll come down to, but because Ocean's work elaborate intergenerational trauma, family relationships. Immigrant experience and more nuanced and non-nuanced complexities of identities and desires, and that just so beautifully clicks with me, and I find it very, very real and very, very sharp. That it makes my skin crawl in a good ways. <laughs>、uh, so I think, yeah, that's why I love、um, Ocean, but. Beyond Ocean, I think、um, others poets、uh, who are you know favorite of mine include Nesim Ezekiel, Langston Hughes, Ada Limon, Asia Monet, and Amanda Gorman, of course. <laughs> and、uh, a poem now that holds dearly to my heart.、Um, I do have one, and、um, that poem is called Harlem. And that's by Langston Hughes. That poem has been on my desk since I was seventeen. So I've written that down, and wherever I go, so you know, I've done bachelor's, master's, PhD, postdoc. Wherever I go, and I have my space, I put up that poem. And that poem basically creates a space for me. And <clears throat> why I love that poem is because it gives me hope. Inspiration, validation, and power that my dreams matter. The poem was originally written in I think 1951, and originally talks about、uh, the individual and collective dream of Black community in America, like specifically Harlem, and hence the name, and the fight for racial justice and equality, and that's basically the dream, and. So yeah, it just clicks at so many different levels, and I absolutely adore and love、um, Langston Hughes poems. And I think yeah, this is this poem is has a special place in my heart. You'll have to give that a read. Thanks for the recommendation.、Um, of course, I remember you went to see Ocean. I think I saw that.、Um, You had. Oh my、uh, god, that、uh, was amazing! Or, tell us about that. <laughs> I was thrilled. So,、um, Ocean's latest work is "Time as a Mother,"、uh, which is a collection of poems where, in which、um, Ocean is again, once again, you know, picks onto the themes that I had mentioned. Why I love Ocean, but at the same time,、um, he. He uses poetry in this particular book、um, as a medium for grieving. So he's grieving for the loss of his dead mother, who passed away last few years before he started working on this book, I assume. And so he uses poetry as a medium to grieve, and you know, and while talk about these bigger issues that I picked upon, and it's a spectacle. The book is. Beautiful poetry is amazing in there, and it was amazing to see Ocean for the first time in live, you know. And that was an amazing event where you know he read his own poetry、uh, from that book, and I think I was thrilled that I, you know, they had, you know, when you go to these bookstore events, you sometimes have these offers where you can partake in some lottery or stuff like that, and I put my name on. I have. I'm not lying. I've never won anything in my life. Not lottery. Nothing. You know, none of those things really work for me. I'm like one of those least probable people whose name or number would ever come up on a lottery ticket. But despite that, I, you know, it doesn't bother me to like try my luck out. But in this particular case, I was so ecstatic because guess what? I actually won that vinyl of Ocean reading his poetry. Uh, from the book、uh, "Time Is a Mother," and I'm like, I could be no more happier. It was just like I want like a million dollars, so that was amazing. <laughs> wow, that is incredible. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. It was fate. 
<laughs> yes, I think universe knew how much I like ocean, right, and its poetry. So I think I want to like hold on to that record for the rest of my life. Now it's a prized possession. Um, and one thing that um our listeners are probably interested a little bit uh about this, but um with our science kind of focus, uh, do you see your poetry contributing to scientific discovery uh, and vice versa? Is there some sort of intersection or uh, where, you know, you, you've you actually incorporated some of that into your poetry or, or yeah, the other way around? Absolutely. Um, and I think I have definitely embraced us science in my poetry not in terms of the syntax but in terms of the the choice of words I use I have a poem called f is equal to ma (laughs) some people (laughs) and I have another poem that is called gowns going and gowns by gowns I'm referring to town or gown that sort of academic profile and that touches on on you know specifically bias and discrimination in the academic research culture such as in publishing and funding so yeah I do have you know I'm like my poetry has definitely been um influenced or you know inspired by the science I do but now the other side is how I communicate science using poetry I think I haven't really like gotten to that part yet um, because I find that that even more challenging because I think one of the <clears throat> great things with science is that you want to um, disseminate accurate information. You want to be factual. I think this is what we have learned and this is what we do. Um, but I see the power the poetry holds, though. For instance, you know, you know, million, there are millions of research publications out there, right? But and then we can now ask how many of those research papers are actually useful or have actually reached to the people that who need them, right? Or other researchers. So I see that discovery is also linked to accessibility. So people, if they would have access to that science, they would be able to build on their further story, right? So that's how the research works. You build on what's existing in the literature and then you go on out doing your experiments. And I can see that poetry can be used as a conduit or an expression to communicate scientific findings. But what would be the balance of keeping it factual and accurate is something I have to work on, right? I mean, it can be used for experiences, but like how poetry should be used to communicate research is something um, would be an amazing endeavor. Um, And I have not like tapped into that, but I know uh, that people such as Charles Darwin and that, you know, Bible, The Origin of Species, was essentially inspired by Charles Darwin's interest in poetry and his hanging out with another buddy who was actually a poet. So the the perspectives that, you know, he, the poetry provides in approaching the nature or the natural world in itself can can be such a synergistic phenomena and my poetry hasn't done it so so far and i hope maybe i would have avenues for that in future but i i am looking forward to people doing that already <laughs> and i do know some people who actually communicate science using poetry yeah it's it's a beautiful way of depicting science and and it increases the accessibility of the science potentially to a wider already audience um mm-hmm. Yeah, and and um, we're curious, what's next on the horizon for you? Ooh, I call it the million dollar question. I uh, <laughs> I think of finding a space for myself, uh, and what I mean by that is, um, I'm on the job market now. So for the listeners out there, if you have resources, hire me. I'm just kidding. But what I'm trying to say that is, um, I would love to be in academia and trying to create a space for myself where I can utilize my background and education and skills in conducting research that matters and making our academic spaces 
much more accessible and equitable, right? And then at the same time, using those research to sort of pull strings in the policy sphere because representation matters and who made decision matters, and at the same time, trying to educate and mentor the younger generation. So that would be the dream job, but let's see where I end up going. <laughs> Yeah, and and good luck with that, and and to our listeners, thank um, you. Mayank is yeah, is on the job market, so please uh, do reach out to him um, if you have any opportunities, and we'll be sure to spread the word about that as well. Um, and I'm wondering if you could share some tips on um, getting into science, in into poetry for some of the younger audience members who may be uh, budding scientists or poets out there. Ooh, so um, for the younger poets to get in science, I would probably try to define things um, as in things that we know in terms of utilizing um, more natural laws, such as playing with very, very obvious uh, natural laws such as gravity, right? Gravity exists as fact, but how would you actually embrace gravity in your uh, poetic expression? Playing with those things, playing with force, playing with mass, playing with energy. Of course, they're all like, you know, playing with atoms, playing with the molecules of life, the dance of atoms, you know? So it's just playing with something that they are already familiar with, but also encompasses the natural world. And for scientists, I think it just comes from reading. So I would say, go to your favorite bookstore and then try to peruse through some of those poetry books. Maybe take a read at the first poem. And if you think that is something that sort of tickles you or, you know, suits you in some way, pick that up. And I think you'll probably have some words to describe sooner. <laughs> That's great advice. I might even take that up as as a therapeutic um, uh, avenue <laughs> for me, uh, poetry as uh, Mayank's prescription. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been an oh absolute pleasure having you on our Behind Our Science show today. Your insights between the intersections of poetry and science have been really enlightening. Uh, lots of great tips there too. And uh, to our listeners, we hope that this episode inspires you to explore poetry and science uh, and their crossovers uh, with uh, science and poetry and poetry in science, because that is a really novel way of seeing these uh, two quite uh, seemingly distinct entities, but there is a lot of overlap there. Um, and uh, thank you again for tuning in to Behind Our Science. We'll see you next time. Thank you everyone for tuning in for this episode of Behind Our Science. We hope you enjoyed it. Tune in for our next episode where we discuss wellness, especially in science. So stay tuned until next time.